uh, Alexei Santanovich, the work is Physiologically Inspired Cognitive Systems. Alexei, are you ready? Uh, yes. Uh, can you, you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see. All right. So this will be a cumulative talk for several of my presentations. Uh, and I will also talk in general about the field. So let me start with uh, the following picture. When I published uh, a paper 10 years ago about the biker challenge, I identified several problems that are uh, still unresolved and uh, some of them are partially solved, uh, but altogether they are necessary to to solve the challenge, which is uh, to create a functional equivalent of the human mind. Uh, looking at uh, this set today, I can uh, name the following problems that can be divided into easy or relatively easy and difficult as always in AI. This reminds the history of AI in general, and now it is about the bike challenge, which is the challenge to create a real life computational equivalent of the human mind, capturing its highest cognitive functionality using solutions inspired by the brain. So it turns out that uh, sensory perceptions such as vision, audition, turned out to be relatively easy with, uh, of course, some problems that remain unresolved now. Uh, so uh, relatively easy was uh, text processing without really understanding the text as well as speech generation. Uh, generation of expressive behavior, including expression of emotions, that, that was also an easy problem to solve. Uh, classical fields like problem solving, planning, logical reasoning, decision making, imagery, a general knowledge representation. That, that's uh, all parts of the classical AI that mostly belong to the previous century. Uh, as well as simple theory of mind or uh, representation of simple emotions, unlike complex emotions that they still do not know how to represent. As, uh, and uh, among the difficult problems are such things as con context understanding, common sense reasoning, goal setting, creativity and insight, emotional intelligence, especially understanding of emotions themselves uh, when it comes to social or complex emotions, generation of social behavior, self-awareness and self-regulation. Particularly difficult is the problem of defining tests and metrics for human likeness of artificial intelligence, whereas tests and metrics for humans is an easy problem. Okay, so I would like to now talk about uh, several selected problems uh, from this list and I will start with the problem of complex emotions. We all heard the uh, very nice informative talk of Antonio Lieta who developed a model of uh, complex emotions as combinations of uh, simple emotions represented here on the uh, several models. They all converge basically to the same. Uh, but my opinion is that it is not sufficient to have just uh, diets of uh, simple emotions to represent complex emotions. And this is why we developed this concept of moral schemas that actually uh, reflect uh, relationships among the agents and, and uh, represent social relationships. And the idea of a moral schema is that uh, you have uh, some sort of a normal condition uh, which must be achieved and maintained and that normal condition is uh, represented by the set of feelings so uh, i'm not uh, going to describe all the details of the theory because i do not have time for this uh, i just want to say that we have uh, several projects uh, based on this theory implemented in uh, in simulations of virtual reality and uh, explored in uh, human subject experiments. And these are virtual registers, virtual, virtual poster presenters, as you see here, virtual 
PET uh, virtual convention center. Uh, you see a screenshot at the bottom with uh, John Laird among participants in our conference, uh, a, a virtual partner dance, and so on. Uh, in general, this approach involves a combination of uh, five directions of research, one of which design of the paradigms and uh, implementation of them in uh, platforms such as uh, uh, virtual reality, uh, virtual environment, uh, extended reality, uh, as well as robotic platforms. We, we are starting using them to the, another set of uh, problems uh, involves multimodal interface that enables emotional communications uh, between the human and uh, the artificial agent, uh, including facial expression, gaze, voice, speech, gesture, body language, actions, so on. Uh, then we have two kinds of models that control the agent behavior, the cognitive models and neural network models, or, or should I should say cognitive symbolic models and neural network models. And finally, the problem of text, uh, tests and the metrics, which I am going to briefly discuss now on the example of our uh, project called Psychometer. Uh, and uh, let's start with the question, uh, would it be um, possible to uh, conduct psychological testing of a person during ordinary conversation like registration in a hotel or buying airline tickets and so on? And if yes, uh, how how this can be done with an artificial agent. So we uh, took this uh, challenge and uh, the study was organized as follows. We had subjects, human subjects, uh, uh, performing uh, psychological tests like big five. And uh, we, we had the same subjects participating in uh, participating in, in the interaction with the virtual registrar where they had a simple conversation and their choice of answers was recorded. So uh, this is the list of questions and answers. This is the example of the dialogue. And uh, let me show you briefly uh, how it looks when the subject takes uh, this test in virtual reality. On the left is what the subject sees, uh, and on the right is the real room. Uh, so mm, what turns out is that, uh, that yes, the model was controlled by uh, this e-biker cognitive architecture that, again, I do not have time to describe. So uh, when we did uh, the analysis of responses, actually, in this case, we had responses collected in Survey Monkey just in parallel with that experiment. And it turned out that uh, th there is a very strong uh, correlation, if not a, a quasi-linear dependence between uh, results of uh, psychological tests and results of uh, behavior uh, logging in this experiment, which means that indeed we can record uh, and uh, obtain characteristics of the subject personality and possibly uh, emotional state uh, during this simple conversation. And uh, the next challenge is, of course, to do it dynamically in a free uh, open scenario of a conversation with, with the realistic agent. And by the way, the reason why I'm talking about it here is that the same method can be used for artifacts. If we can establish a connection between behavioral pattern and psychological type of person, then we can uh, measure the psychological type of, of a virtual agent. And that will give us the direct answer to the question how, how human-like it is and what's the distance to the goal. And once we have this distance, uh, the goal can be, can be achieved. The, the uh, next topic that I would like to address briefly is modeling of insight and creativity and this is the work that was done together with Vladimir Redko. Uh, the insight phenomenon is uh, general characterized by a situation when uh, there is a certain problem like in, in this case connecting the two ropes hanging from the ceiling uh, and the solution does not come into mind immediately then uh, the problem goes into subconsciousness for, for a while and 
uh, then there is a sudden feeling of enlightenment followed by awareness about an idea of solution. I'm sure that you all had this experience uh, in, in your life. And finally, there is an elaboration of the idea that leads to a valid solution. It turns out that uh, this uh, phenomenon can be described with a model based on the dual process theory, uh, including uh, system one and system two, let's say, uh, uh, it could be called working memory and long-term memory or consciousness and subconsciousness. Uh, and so we have one system uh, that uh, elaborates the solution, uh, reasoning about it logically and builds uh, the solution as a chain of connections between schemas, let's say, in this case. At the same time, there, there is a massive parallel processing going on. Uh, I'm sorry, this... Uh, this this should be uh, system two and this should be system one or vice versa so there is massive uh, processing go going on in system one when we have um, a solution candidate solutions uh, popping up and they need to be tried uh, so when this happens uh, the, the system will send a signal to system two that possibly a solution is found. So in general, we have uh, four possibilities of this scenario, like a aha moment when uh, the, the search requested by system two was successful in system one and the solution was, was found. That's not an insight yet. Another is the feeling of insight uh, that opens the mind in system two and uh, makes it listen to candidate uh, proposal from system one, which then turns into an idea that leads to a solution. Or there could be false insight when uh, this process does not lead to a solution. And finally, there may be a latent insight when uh, the moment is lost and the solution did not come in time. So actually all these four possibilities can be modeled uh, with the model that I briefly described, and we did uh, some simulations. And maybe this is the way to build uh, insightful, creative AI, uh, we shall see. Uh, finally, I uh, would like to entertain briefly a more general idea, uh, which is a combination of deep learning with evolutionary computation. computation. Why do this? It seems crazy because uh, to do uh, deep learning, you need a tremendous computer power and to do evolutionary computation, you may need even bigger computer power. So uh, connecting the two, you would multiply the necessary power requirement and uh, which makes the problem absolutely not solvable. Well, my opinion is that every problem can be simplified to a way that uh, it becomes solvable virtually on any computer. And, and so why do this again? Because uh, just think of it that uh, all cognitive models are designed based on algorithms uh, need uh, human labor and it's all done by hands, whereas neural networks uh, are learning themselves like they only need data to learn. So one possibility is that they can learn from uh, data generated by cognitive models, or they can learn from each other, from each other examples of behavior. And in this, in this case, it becomes an evolutionary scheme. So actually in this diagram, which I again do not have time to describe in detail, uh, there are uh, several steps of this evolutionary scheme uh, during the first of which uh, neural networks are learning uh, how to behave from the cognitive model behavior. Then they uh, start evolving themselves uh, according to a genetic algorithm scheme in which uh, the role of mutation is played by learning, uh, by teaching one network, another, teaching by another network. And uh, the recombination would be the case when one neural network learns from two neural networks, uh, which means uh, uh, the functionality that develops inside that network would be some kind of combination of, of the two functionalities. And uh, the role of the fitness function is, is uh, 
determined uh, originally uh, again by the cognitive model. Uh, later on, this role uh, will be taken over by neural networks that uh, will become judges. So the, the, there is a co-evolution of two populations of neural networks. And uh, finally, we may have a solution that will substantially uh, exceed uh, uh, the level originally present in those cognitive architectures without uh, human labor, without uh, manual engineering and so on. And that's also interesting because uh, it, it seems like the beginning of a real artificial life when things start evolving by themselves, developing by themselves, not requiring uh, human participation at every step. Okay, I will finish here. Uh, thank you, and I, I would be happy to discuss your questions. By the way, this uh, title of my talk is also the uh, name, the title of the special issue of the journal that uh, is just open, and uh, you all are welcome to submit papers to it. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. Now we will proceed with the question from the audience. If anyone has any question, please raise your hand. Okay, no questions. So we'll now proceed with the next presentation. Thank you, Alexei. Okay, you're welcome.